Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a fantastic series, a challenging series, on the Book of Revelation. And this is lesson number 12 in that series for March 23 of 2019, entitled Judgment on Babylon. Hmm, what could that possibly mean? Well, as usual, we'd like to start with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we're so thankful that you've given us at least some hints about what's coming. Not everything here is easy to understand, but uh, help us to gather what we can and to understand what we can so that we will not be surprised as events unfold before us. We thank you for this privilege we have of studying your word each time we get together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Revelation 17 and 18 are two of the most challenging chapters in the Bible to interpret correctly. Large portions of these two chapters are descriptions of what will happen to the devil, his associates, the sea, the sea beast and the land beast, and all the people <coughs> on earth of various kinds that join his side. So that's just a, a start anyway. The ultimate result will be a gathering together of the demonic side in preparation for the Battle of Armageddon. <clears throat> and so we're going we're gonna to start with that, Revelation 16, 13 and 14. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the day of the great, for the battle, the great day of Almighty God. Okay, so that's the context. <clears throat> what kind of battle is the Battle of Armageddon? When will it take place? Is there a possibility that a part of it could be at the second coming while another part would be at the third coming? What kinds of beings are the frogs that come out of the mouths of the evil trinity? And just to review, who are the evil trinity? Dragon. The dragon or Satan. The sea beast and the land beast. The sea beast, which represents Roman Catholicism as far as we understand it. And the land beast represents apostate Protestantism, right? What is the relationship between the miracles that they perform and the preparation for the Battle of Armageddon? Is it possible that... The, yeah? Get attention, confirm, try to confirm what that, that what they're saying is true. Yep. So, now... Are you going to answer all these questions that you've brought up? <laughs> uh, I didn't promise to do that, did I? No, I didn't hear you say that. Why did you think God gave these, vis these visions or images to John? Were they primarily for him or, and his fellow Christians in his day? Or maybe were, are they primarily for us? Did he even understand what they meant? Yeah. And then yeah. your comment about the angels in heaven, what did they think of yeah. these messages? That's pretty interesting to think about. Yeah, remember that we've got four living creatures, we've got 24 elders, and then we've got 100 million angels watching everything God is doing. As a part of the seventh plague, the unity of Babylon will be shattered. It will be split into three parts. What do you think that means? We've got three leaders. We've got the devil. We've got the Roman Catholicism. We've got apostate Protestantism. Is that the three parts? Well, well there's several references to a third mm -hmm. will die, etc. And you've said several times it's not literally a third, but a large portion. Mm -hmm. So is this a large portion of, the, uh, of Babylon will be shattered? Well, we need to read Revelation 6, 16, verses 17 to 21. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air. A loud voice came from the throne of the temple, saying, It is done. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, and a terrible earthquake. There has never been such an earthquake since the creation of the human race. This was the worst earthquake of all. The great city that was split into three parts, and the cities of all countries were destroyed. The cities of all countries were destroyed? God remembered great Babylon and made her drink the wine from his cup, the wine of his furious anger. All the islands disappeared. All the mountains vanished. 
huge hailstones, each weighing as much as 50 kilograms, that's 110 pounds, fell from the sky on people who cursed God on account of the plague of hail because it was such a terrible plague. So, as we studied in our last lesson, could anybody survive this kind of a, an event? Not if it were universal over, all over the world. It has to be just in places. Well, we hear this loud voice coming out of the temple on the seventh angel, the seventh mm -hmm. plague, isn't it? That's the last one. It is done then. It is done. Maybe they don't close till the seventh angel. The close of probation? Yeah. It is done, isn't that? We, don't we talk about well, the close of probation? Well, what? But we have, we have Revelation 7, Revelation 14 that talk about people have already been sealed and already been marked. If they've sealed or marked, that means probation is already closed. So what <clears throat> the seventh angel pouring out his bowl, seven of the last plagues, it is done. What is that referring to? Well, obviously we're at the end. Maybe it's We're not over. Maybe it's not. It's done at that time, but it has been done. It has been done. Just before the second coming been. of Jesus, the, that unity wow. will be broken up. Satan's unity. Those who formerly supported Babylon will turn against her. What could it possibly mean to say that the city will be split into three parts? Is it really possible that the cities of all the countries will be destroyed? That the mountains and all islands vanish? Will there be a reason, a result? Will that be a result of the earthquake? Or something else? Will this occur just before Jesus appears, or will it occur sometime earlier? <clears throat> Again, you're answering all these questions in the second. Well, right? I'm suggesting that when this happens, there's probably not going to be possible for people to survive much longer. This must be very, very near the, the final end. All the islands are gone. That means Australia. And the mountains. Australia, I think, is an island. No, That's Australia is a continent. That's, no. But New Zealand. Oh, no, New Zealand, right. New Zealand is an island. An island. So Papua New Guinea is an island. Yeah, Greenland yeah. is an island. Hawaii. Hawaii is Hawaii a series is island. set of islands. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is this literal? Or are we looking at something different? Um, There's a whole line, line of volcanoes right. running down through. Still there. stuck back there. The, yeah. the great city was split <coughs> into three parts. Yeah. Are they fighting each what other? What great city are we talking Babylon. Babylon? Babylon, yeah. They could Babylon be fighting each other. That's fighting happened before. Other. Yeah. Yeah. This demonstrates where Satan's government ends. It, yeah. it, it splits apart. He can't create unity. Babylon is confusion. Mm -hmm. So could it be that confusion really splits them yeah. into? Um, yeah. They could be attacking each other. Well, the sixth plague, which we just read, describing in Revelation 16, 12 to 16, and the seventh plague in 17 to 21 verses, are just brief synopses of what is further described <coughs> in Revelation 17 and 18. How will the collapse of Babylon actually take place? So let's look at Revelation 17, 1 to 11. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, Come, I will show you how the famous prostitute is to be punished that great city that is built near many rivers. So it seems pretty clear that that's what's being attacked, right? The kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the people of the world became drunk from drinking the wine of her immorality. The spirit took control of me, and the angel carried me to a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a red beast that had names insulting to God written all over it. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. Have we seen any other beasts earlier in Revelation that had seven heads and ten horns? Yes. Mm -hmm. Where? The dreaded beast coming out of the water. Okay. So this is the sea one beast. from the water. Mm -hmm. The sea, sea beast sea had beast. Yeah, come in where there's lots of people. People. But there's another. It's in the desert now. This desert, not a soul. No. There's another. One. There's another sea beast. I mean, the, not another sea beast. There's another beast that's with seven heads and ten horns. Where's that one? 13.1. Well, that's the one we just talked about. What about chapter 12? Verse 3. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon. Notice that. With seven heads and ten horns and a crown on each of his heads. That's the dragon. That's... That's dragon. That's Satan. Dragon, yeah. What's consistent is seven heads and ten horns. Yes. From different places. What was that verse? 
Well, what is it about this seductive harlot, the prostitute riding on the dragon? Actually, we didn't finish reading that. Let me go back to it. Um, the woman who was <coughs> dressed in purple and scarlet and covered with gold ornaments, precious stones and pearls. In her hand, she held a gold cup full of obscene and filthy things, the result of immorality. Now, if you remember Revelation 12, verse 14, we should go back there. Let's look at that really quick. Revelation 12, verse, I mean, Revela yeah, Revelation 12, <coughs> verse 14, it says, the, the pure church here, when the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he began to pursue the woman who had been given birth to the boy, and we believe that's the church that had given birth to Christ. She was given the two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place in the, in the desert. desert where she will be taken care of for three and a half hour, years yes. free from the dragon's attack. Ah, okay. so here the ten horns and uh, seven heads and ten horns mm -hmm. are really in the desert where the woman was hiding mm -hmm. and where she was persecuted for yes. 1260 years. Yes. So that's where this beast is dwelling, killing okay. people. God's well, people. Well, what is he doing there? Let's let's. He's killing about. them. Okay, on on his forehead. Well, we we we've already read about all the terrible things that's written on him. Um, on her forehead was written a name that has a secret meaning. Where Great are you reading? Huh? Where are you reading? I'm reading back on now Revelation 17 verse five. I'm trying to finish my passage I started out with. On her forehead was written a name that has a secret meaning. Great Babylon the mother of all the prostitutes and perverts in the world. Hold on a minute. Who was the woman who went into the desert? It's the pure woman who went. The pure woman who went into the desert. <laughs> and who was this woman in the desert? She was riding on the <coughs> beast, on the dragon. This is a prostitute in, in Revelation 17. But and I saw that the woman... 12, it looks like it's the pure woman. Yeah. The woman who had given birth to a male child. Exactly. But, but, but the wait. woman was given the two <laughs> wings of the great eagle. I'm not sure what that meant. So yeah. she could fly from the serpent. There it demonstrates that the serpent and the dragon are really the same person. Yep. Individual. Well, now we have this. I saw the woman who was drunk with the blood of God's people and the blood of those who were killed because they had been loyal to Jesus. When I saw her, I was completely amazed. Why are you amazed? The angel asked me. I will tell you the secret meaning of the woman and of the beast that carries her, the beast with seven heads and ten horns. That, that beast was once alive, but lives no longer, is about to come up from the abyss. Now this should, this should make things even more confusing, because the beast that was once alive, but lives no longer, and then is about to come up, who do we think that is? Well, 1798 and uh, 1929. We believe that's the the demise, or apparently demise, apparent demise, fatal wound to the Catholic Church, and then it's coming back. But it comes up from the abyss. Who lives in the abyss? Satan. That's Satan's home. Right. And will go off to be destroyed. The people living on earth whose names have not been written before the creation of the world in the Book of the Living will all be amazed as they look at the beast. It was once alive, now it no longer lives, but it will reappear. This calls for wisdom and understanding. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Ah, Rome sits on seven hills. It does. There are also seven kings. Five of them have fallen. One still rules and the other one has not yet come. When he comes, he must rule only a little while. And the beast that was once alive but lives no longer is itself an eighth king who is one of the seven is going off to be destroyed. Wow. Okay. Everybody understands what all that is about, right? <laughs> no. Well, let me just ask a few questions. What is it about this seductive harlot, the prostitute riding on the dragon or the sea beast, Re Revelation 12 and 13, that attracts almost the whole world to follow it? Is it his miracles? Why do people want to follow this critter? Well, it's trying to imitate the church that went into the wilderness to be to hide mm -hmm. uh, so it's coming out of the wilderness uh, this is me you know and but it's not yeah and then we have ten horns or maybe there are ten kings 
And then finally, the final question, how does the Lamb with his called, chosen, faithful followers, and we know that they can't be very many, defeat almost the entire world to oppose them? So who is this woman or the great city described as Babylon? How does God apparently influence the peoples of the world first to support Babylon? Or does God do that? And then to destroy her? We've already suggested in earlier lessons that practicing sexual immorality in a spiritual sense means having an illicit relationship between the church and the businesses, and the business world or the state. So how would that work out? You think the church has ever been supported by businesses or <laughs> vice versa? Well, by businesses maybe, but if it's, if it's uh, supported by the state, that means the government controls your religion. Has that ever happened? Yes. Well, there's some more puzzling things. Look at Revelation 18, verses 8 to 10. Because of this, in one day, she'll be stuck with plagues, disease, grief, and famine, and she will be burnt with fire because the Lord God who judges her is mighty. We've already read in our last lesson about Babylon being built, burnt with a fire. The kings of the earth who took part in her immorality and lust will cry and weep over the city when they see the smoke from the flames that consume her. They stand a long way up because they are afraid of sharing in her suffering. They say how terrible, how awful this great and mighty city Babylon. In just one hour you've been punished. The merchants of the earth also cry and mourn for her because no one buys their goods any longer and so forth. So, one hour in prophetic time is about two weeks. Does that mean that this final end time cooperation between the forces of evil will only last for about two weeks? That would be great. Could be. Could be. <clears throat> How will God and his forces defeat them? What does it mean to pay her back double in Revelation 18.6? Well, we know that a, a woman in the Bible represents a symbol for God's people. A pure woman then would be a pure and true church, while an apostate or prostitute woman would be a false church. Ancient Babylon depended on the Euphrates River for its life. Modern Babylon will depend on the support of masses of people. So what specific groups are involved in this Ill illicit relationship? Well, Revelation 17, 2, we can look at a few verses here. Revelation 17, 2, the kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the people of the world became drunk from drinking the wine of her immorality. Okay, kings and the people of the world. Revelation 14, 8, a second angel followed the first, the first one, saying, she has fallen, great Babylon has fallen, she made all people drink of her wine, the strong line of her immoral lust. And Revelation 18, 2 and 3, he cried out in loud voice, she has fallen, great Babylon has fallen, she is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits, all kinds of filth and hateful birds, for all the nations had drunk her wine. The kings of the earth practiced and so forth. So we, we see particularly the kings of the earth, then all the peoples are all nations. So what would kings of the earth represent? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> there would be any kind of rulership. Yeah. Back in those days, kings were the primary. Mm -hmm. Although you had pharaohs and but they were called kings sometimes, too. But the kings in, in, in the Bible almost always represent <coughs> individuals. These yeah, are the kings governments. representing the governments. Yeah, right. the governments. Okay, Pol political powers. <coughs> They're portrayed as having an illicit relationship with this religious power called Babylon. Does that mean using the influence of the church to profit in one's business? Also using businesses to promote one's religion? How often have we seen that happen? Well, <coughs> look at uh, Isaiah 121 as an example from the Old Testament. We've said that the book of Revelation uses lots of examples from the Old Testament. Isaiah 121, the city that once was faithful is behaving like a whore. At one time it was filled with righteous people, but now only murderers remain. Wow. That's not a good picture, is it? Mm. Jeremiah 3. I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing, but basically it says the same thing. So how is that related to Revelation 13, 16, and 17? The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. 
no one could buy or sell without having this mark. That is, the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. So what is Satan's attempt? What's he trying to accomplish here? Well, he's trying to force everyone to do his will. To worship and if you him. don't, and if you don't do his will, what? You can't. You won't, can't buy. You can't sell anything. You can't make a living. Yeah. Is it in the books right now? Answer is yes. How is or was God actually involved in all these events? Does God actually hold back the rain when people sin? That's what it said in Jeremiah three. Well, the second group that are involved in an illicit relationship with the harlot Babylon includes all peoples of the earth. Wow. Or governed masses. Why would so many people be fooled by the devil's lies and deceit? It is quite possible that as the plagues begin to fall, people turn to that religious power hoping that it will protect them from the plagues. Look at, look at Isaiah 28.7. Even the prophets and the priests are so drunk that they stagger. They have drunk so much wine and liquor that they stumble in confusion. The prophets are too drunk to understand the visions that God sends, and the priests are too drunk to decide the cases that are brought to them. The tables where they sit are all covered with vomit, and not a clean spot is left. How would you like to go to church under those circumstances? Terrible description. <laughs> this is supposed to. <laughs> this is supposed to be true prophets because yes. they have been given the message yeah. and the priests. Could those who claim to be representing God to the world be completely confused in their guidance and direction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is it that the masses always seem to get things wrong? Jim, your favorite quote. We go to, what do the masses do? You remember? Which text are we referring to? We go, I wouldn't talk about text, I'm talking, they go, gonna. Something like they go uh, crazy all, all as a group and come back one, oh, one, oh, to the yeah, senses okay. one by People one. People go uh, crazy or, uh, in, in a crowd. Mad, uh, People go mad rapidly in a crowd and yeah. return to their senses slowly one by one. By one. one. Yeah, exactly. It's, really it's not my quote, uh, no. by the way. It's from a book called... Uh, Popular delusions and the madness of crowds. Yeah, and that's pretty interesting. <laughs> it is true. Yes. Yeah. Very true. Well, they look what they f when they foment all this unrest in cities and what have you. Yeah. It, it, there's well, no real serious thinking going on. Bob mentality. Yeah. yeah. One um, puzzling <laughs> question is raised by the few by these few chapters in Revelation. Revelation 17:3 talks about going to a desert and seeing a red beast with names insulting to God written all over it. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. So who was or, or what was that red beast? Well, we already looked at Revelation 12, 3 and 4, and there's a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns dragging a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to the earth. So they, that could only be Satan. <coughs> mm -hmm. Clearly this red beast or the red dragon is a reference to Satan himself. But as we read on in Revelation 17, it seems to imply that the red beast is actually talking about the sea beast of Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Is this a case of Satan actually being in charge, but hiding behind his earthly surrogate? Yes, because the 1260 years prophecy, whoever is in charge, whatever system is in charge, that system is Satan himself. Yes. Well, notice that the sea beast is not described as being red or scarlet in color. So what we have here is some kind of a collusion. Satan seems to be in charge, but he's letting his earthly surrogates act on his behalf. But at the same time, it's still ten horns and seven heads. Mm -hmm. The sea beast meaning, meaning that the behavior of the sea beast will be very but, satanic, basically. Yeah. Well, in his vision, John saw a woman riding on a scarlet or red beast. Woman, women, we have come to believe, represent religious entities. Beasts represent political or military power. So what we have is not a complete identity between religion and political power, religion and political power but two separate entities cooperating. So what do you think? Is the woman guiding the beast or is the beast carrying the woman without guidance from the woman? 
Anyone want to take a stab at that one? Yes. <laughs> one or the other or both. One or the other or both, huh? So what is the relationship between the pure, pure woman who fled to the desert and the prostitute woman riding on the beast in the, in the desert in Revelation 17.3? What is the difference? What do we know about the history of the church? It fled to the desert as a pure church. And I remember we're talking about all professed Christians initially. Right? In the days of the apostles, the church was relatively pure. We look at the, the, the church of Ephesus back in the beginning and the church of Smyrna. They were still quite pure. And what happens by the time we get down to the end? Thyatira, for example, and down through that? Well, in history, when Constantine Christianized, uh, everything went easy. Mm -hmm. And from then on, uh, apostasy came in big time. However, the Lord has always had a people yeah. who served him. That's the beauty. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to see how this woman is dressed. Look at Exodus 28, 5 and 6. The skilled workers are to use blue, purple, and red wool, gold thread, and fine linen. They are to make the ephod a blue, purple, and red wool, gold thread, and fine linen decorated with embroidery. That's the century. This is talking about the high priest's garments. And look at verses 36 to 38 in that same chapter, chapter Ezekiel, Exodus 28. Make an ornament of pure gold and a grave on it, dedicated to the Lord. Tie it to the front of the turban with a blue cord. Aaron is to wear it on his forehead so that I, the Lord, will accept all the offerings that the Israelites dedicate to me, even if the people commit some error in offering them. So what is a woman wearing? Priestly garments. She's trying to look like garments. a priest. But what does it say <clears throat> on her forehead? An ornament. Blasphemy. Oh. Clearly this prostitute riding on the beast is dressed in colors and ornaments meant to resemble the clothing and ornaments of the high priest in the Old Testament. She's holding a glass from the temple that reminds us of the feast of Belshazzar described in Daniel 5, verses 2 to 4. What's the story behind that? Did he not order the temple? Um, yeah. How did how did those ve how did those vessels get there? <coughs> Babylon captured uh, Jerusalem. captured by Nebuchadnezzar and ta yes. taken to Babylon, and so here's Belshazzar trying to show the superiority of his god to all the other gods, and so he says, "Bring some of those gold vessels that came from the temple in Jerusalem. We'll pour our our wine in it and drink it." And of course. That was the night he died. So why does drinking the blood of the saints or martyrs make the harlot drunk? What does it mean to drink their blood? Good question. Well, if you... Can we think of any examples when people have started off on a job to, to eliminate some... Well, look at Hitler and his attempt to destroy the Jews. The more they did it, the easier it went. The, the, the worse, worse they, they went at it. And that's often the case. That kind of stuff happens. By contrast, what happens to the faithful that are persecuted? What's the famous saying? Came from Tertullian and then comp co copied by Fox in his Book of Martyrs. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. <coughs> well, is this harlot beast, this harlot riding on the beast, somehow related to the Jezebel in Revelation 2, 20 to 23? Let's, let's just look at that really quickly. But this is what I have against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a messenger of God. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into practicing sexual immorality and eat food that has been offered to idols. I have given her time to repent of her sins, but, but she does not want to turn from immorality. And so I will throw her on a bed where she and those 
who committed adultery with her will suffer terribly. I will do this now unless they repent of the wicked things they did with her. I will also kill her followers, and then all the churches will know that I am the one who knows everyone's thoughts and wishes. I will repay each of you according to what you have done. Wow. We lived in a day we live in a day of ecumenical ideas and movements. It may be difficult for us to recognize that our Christian brothers and sisters and other denominations might end up being responsible for the terrible persecution at the end. Some former Adventists may be our worst enemies. Whoa. Someone help us with that quotation? It's Gary. Gary? Yes. As the storm approaches, <clears throat> a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuation to stir up the rulers against them. That comes from the Great Controversy, page 608, paragraph 2. That should be scary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <coughs> well, <coughs> Let's read a couple more verses. Look at Revelation 17, 8. That beast was once alive but lives no longer, but it is about to come up from the abyss and will go off to be destroyed. The people living on earth whose names have been not been written before the creation of the world in the book of the living will all be amazed as they look at the beast. It was once alive, now it no longer lives, but it will reappear. So we believe that's talking about the Roman Catholic Church, right? <coughs> and then we have Revelation 13, 8. Boy, oh, here. I need to do this slightly differently. Give me just a second. Would you like me to read it while you're getting there? No, you can. I'll be there right now. Yeah. All people living on earth will worship it, except those whose names are written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. Wow. Well, the scarlet or red beast is identified as one of, is the one who was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. This should immediately remind us of an attempt to counterfeit the description of God himself in Revelation 1, verse 4 and 4, verse 8. And Margaret, I think you have something on that. The beast was, it existed in the past, its prior activities lasted for the prophetic period of 42 months, also known as the 1260 days slash years. See Revelation 13.5 and Lesson 9, Sunday. Is not with its deadly, is not with its deadly wound, see Revelation 13.3, the beast went into its non-existent phase, at least as a persecutor in 1798. It vanished for some time before the world seen, yet it survived. Finally, the healing of the deadly wound, the beast will regain its power and exert in its full, it in full satanic rage. And this is Adult Sabbath School Lesson Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, March 19. Very good. So what kind of events could lead to the rise of religious extremism and persecution similar to that during the Dark Ages? And what will be the result? Let opposition yeah. arise. Let bigotry and intolerance again bear sway. sway. Let persecution, per persecution be kindled and the half-hearted and hypocritical will waver and yield the faith. But the true Christ Christian will stand firm as a rock his faith stronger, his hope brighter, even as in the days of prosperity. 
Wow. Big controversy again. So last time we talked about this idea that the whole thing can't be over until the great controversy is, com is complete. Until Satan has, I mean, God has proved that Satan's completely false in his claims that, well, he could run a better universe than God, you know. And so what do we see here? We see on one side, Satan's people are trying to do everything they can to destroy God's people. And what are the true Christians doing? Standing firm as a rock. How can we prepare ourselves for such a time? I think it's important not to panic and get hysterical or neurotic about it, but we need to be able to stay faithful and trust, and we're promised peace as Christians. That's one of the great blessings that we have in the New Testament. All Paul's writings, he keeps saying, I want you to have peace. Mm -hmm. and in this world, that's not easy to have when you yeah. look at the news. Okay, the next big challenge is Revelation 17, 9 to 11. Let me read it. This calls for wisdom and understanding. Boy, there's an understatement. Yes. <laughs> the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five of them have fallen. One still rules and the other one has not yet come. When he comes, he must rule only a little while. And the beast that was once alive but lives no longer is itself an eighth king who is one of the seven and is going off to be destroyed. Is that all perfectly clear to you? Let's see what it is. Please make some comments. Look at Revelation 13.8. This calls for wisdom. Yes. Just read another verse like that. Whoever is intelligent can work out the meaning of the number of the beast because a number stands for a human name its number is 666. So these seven mountains, or possibly seven hills, may allude to the seven hills upon which the ancient city of Rome was located. These seven mountains are also described as seven kings. That would suggest they are successive, not simultaneous. You don't have seven kings ruling all at the same time. Gordon, I think you can help us here. From the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, it says... These mountains do not symbolize individual kings because Revelation does not deal with individual persons but with systems. In the Bible, mountains often symbolize world powers or empires, and there are several references. In biblical prophecy, kings represent kingdoms, as in Daniel. Thus, the seven mountains symbolize seven great successive empires that dominated the world throughout history through which Satan opposed God and harmed God's people. Can you think of a, na a nation that did that? Babylon. Babylon? Any Egypt. others? Egypt. Egypt is an example. So who could these seven kings possibly represent? One view that has been accepted by many Adventist interpreters suggests that the five kings are those who have dominated, these be kingdoms, those who have dominated and harmed God's people in the past. That would be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. The one is kingdom would be the Roman Empire, which was in power in John's day. If that is indeed the sixth kingdom, then the seventh kingdom, which had not yet come, would be the sea beast of Revelation 13. That would have to be the papacy, which did everything it possibly could to destroy God's faithful true people during the Dark Ages. Furthermore, John is told that there is an eighth world power, although it is one of the seven heads or world powers. If we believe that the kings are sequential, then the eighth must be the seventh head which had received the deadly wound. Would this eighth kingdom then be the beast after its deadly wound had been healed? When the wo world wanders after this beast and is amazed at its healing, could that represent the eighth world power? Well, there's a possibility. Do you see any problems with that? Well, other people have suggested other things. Let's just mention a few. Some people have tried to claim that these, eight, these, these kings are, are, are actually consecutive popes in modern times. This has led to date setting, which has so far always proved to be an error. 
A second view which is popular among Adventist scholars suggests that the five following kings might be Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and the medieval papacy. That would lead the sixth king as being the papacy from 1798 to 1929 when it has lost its power. This interpretation, the interpretation we gave up above seems more likely to me. Well, <clears throat> look at Revelation 17, 12 to 15 again. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet begun to rule, but who will be given authority to rule as kings for one hour with the beast. These ten all have the same purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. They will fight against the lamb, but the lamb, together with his called, chosen, and faithful followers, will defeat them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And compare that with 16, 14 to 16. Okay. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of Almighty God. They listen, I am coming like a thief, happy as he who stays awake and guards his clothes so that he will not walk around naked and be shamed in public. Then the spirits brought the kings together in the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. We talked about that last week. So what about these ten kings or ten horns? Different interpretations have been offered regarding the identities <laughs> of the ten kings. However, Revelation does not tell us who they are. All we can derive from the text is that they are a short-lived political confederacy appearing right before the end of the and supporting the harlot. Their number signifies that the world powers will render total unwavering allegiance to the beast. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, March 21. Okay, so this is not a very powerful argument, but the idea that We've got ten horns, ten kings. That might fit along with the to go the, the ten holes, the, the ten toes of Daniel, too, possibly. Well, look at Revelation seventeen thirteen to fourteen. These ten all have the same purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. They will fight against the lamb, but the lamb, together with his called chosen and faithful followers, will defeat them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So, in light of Revelation 16, 16, then the spirits brought the kings together in a place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Can we put those together? Does that give us any clues? Clearly the Battle of Armageddon is not some military conflict located somewhere in the Middle East. Instead, it is a final conflict just before the second coming of Christ when Satan and his false trinity fight against Christ and his angelic host. That conflict will arise again at the third coming. So what happens at the third coming? That's the final end of sin and sinners. Mm -hmm. Yes. Everyone that ever lived will be alive. Remember when the e all the wicked people are raised at the third coming, Satan says, okay, here's my army. Let's just surround the city and we'll attack it. There's a lot more of us out here than there are of them. We can conquer. We'll get inside there and we'll get to the tree of life and we'll be able to live forever. Right? Yeah. Well, so how do you think Christ is going to conquer them? He will appear on the wall and stand okay. there. Okay. And they will realize and perhaps they'll even see the whole great controversy in their minds. Yep. At least this is, we had a chance. We followed the wrong leader. And yep. every knee shall bow at the time. Mm -hmm. I've often wondered how long will it take them to get ready yeah, to take... Yeah, I have too. I mean, are they, they're going to have to be building some They're going to try to put together <coughs> atomic weapons and... Yeah, how long will I mean, and how de how decrepit will they be after they have been dead? I mean, yeah, it's a they're miracle not. that they're alive when you yeah. think about it. God <laughs> raised them. Yeah, they didn't raise no themselves. 
No. Will they all survive? Will some of them just re-die of their old diseases? Well, but what is the purpose of all of that ex except to uh, seal in the minds of those that are going to live for eternity that uh, it's, 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 it's kind of an aversion therapy, so, yeah, so to yeah. speak. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a capstone of... But I bet there are going to be people who, who are going to say, I could have been there. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the sad part. Up the, whole, the unfallen worlds are watching yeah. all of this. Really? Yeah. Yes, yes. Pretty that's interesting painful. when you think about it. Yes. All the angels and are going to be there. Yes. All the angels that ever have been are going right. to be there. They're all all the people that yep. have ever been. I mean, this is an astounding assembly. Yes. Right. Apparently, the really? peoples of the world see that the prostitute to which they have turned for protection cannot even protect her own city. So the kings of the earth and their followers will turn against her and persecute her. Is this a case of people who have been deceived and disillusioned and are suffering terribly, turning on the one who has deceived them? Well, look at Revelation 18.4. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out, my people, come out from her. You must not take part in her sins. You must not share in her punishment. So what's God trying to say to us? Come Whose out. job is it to give this come out of her message? Us. us. And a lot of what we have studied so far in this lesson, we need to remember that it is our job as Seventh-day Adventist Christians to carry the three angels' messages to the world. That includes calling people out of Babylon. The second angel's message. God does not want any to perish. And just I'm just going to read one verse that suggests that. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed. but wants all to turn away from their sins. That's interesting in light of the idea that people wonder whether or not God is the one who seven, sends the seven last plagues. In light of what we have studied so far in this, while well, we looked at that, God does not want anyone to perish. Revelation 19, 1-10 suggests that many faithful people who have been deceived will no longer be deceived and will respond to the call. Who are these people? How are we to reach out to them? Jim? This message must be given, but while it must be given, we should be careful not to thrust and excuse me, not to thrust yeah, and thrust crowd out. and to condemn those who have co have not the light that we have. We should not go out of their excuse me. We should not go out of our way to make hard thrusts at the Catholics. Among the Catholics, there are many who are most conscientious Christians, mm -hmm. and who walk in all the light that shines upon them, and God will work in their behalf. Those who have had great privileges and opportunities and who have failed to improve their physical, mental, and moral powers are in greater danger and in greater condemnation before God than those who are, are in error upon doctrinal points, yet who seek to live to do good to others. Ellen wow. White, Special Testimony Series A. That's a great comment. I mean, wow. When you think of that, we emphasize doctrine sometimes mm -hmm. a lot. We think that's what's the most important. But Well, doctrines, but really it's, we have a duty to teach. Mm -hmm. That's God's job, He used, and God gave it to us. Mm -hmm. Jesus was a teacher. He was not a penalty payer. And uh, by our lives become as examples uh, for others. Hopefully, that's what we're, what our job is, really. <clears throat> well, we read about a bewildering array of images and alliances in Revelation 16 and 18. There are mountains and kings, harlots and beasts, and a city called Babylon. Charles? The variety of images in these chapters can all be linked to three great worldwide alliances that develop in the final period of Earth's history. Number one, 
there is a great worldwide alliance of religious institutions that join together in opposi opposition to God and his faithful people. This alliance is named by many names, Babylon, the great harlot, the great city, and the woman that rides on the beast. Number okay, let's, let's stop there just a second. We've read about one or more of these names right through quite a bit of Revelation, haven't we? Especially starting from Revelation 12 and, and, and on. So what's going to pull this alliance together? What's going to cause them all to, to come together? Any idea? Worship. Okay, we have said that when at the end of time, one of our previous lessons, we learned that there's not going to be there's not going to be a choice between not worshiping and worshiping. It's going to be a choice of who you worship. Are you going to worship the Satan and his ideals? Or are you going to worship God and his ideals? Okay, two, two. There is a great worldwide alliance of secular political and military powers. This alliance also is named by many names in Revelation. The kings of the whole world, inhabited world, Revelation chapter 16 verse 4, 14. The cities of the nations, Revelation chapter 16 verse 19. The kings of the earth, the earth dwellers, Revelation chapter 17 verse 2. The beast, Revelation chapter 17 verse 3. The seven heads, the seven mountains, the seven kings, Revelation chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, and the ten horns, Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. These secular powers also are represented by the kings, Revelation chapter 18, verse 9, the merchants, Revelation chapter 18, verse 11, and the seafarers, Revelation chapter 18, verse 17. And for those of you who didn't get a chance to write down all those verses. <laughs> you can look in your Bible, your, your teacher's guide, or you can get our, our handout on, on our website at theox.org. That's T H E O X dot O R G, and it has all this material there, and you can look it up. So, this second collection of people, this second gathering, who are those people? Military, political, military powers. Uh, first, or, or rel religious institutions. Mm -hmm. These others are other secular. institutions not involved with religion, more secular. And yeah. all of those institutions operate uh, using force, mm -hmm. which is the antithesis of love. Yeah. There's also a worldwide end time alliance of the saints, which has the following names the sealed. The 144,000, the remnant, the saints, those who keep their garments, and the called, chosen, and faithful followers of the Lamb. And there's a, those are all expressions from Revelation. The last two alliances are precipitated by the final worldwide proclamation of the gospel by the remnant. Through the counterfeit gospel inspired by the demonic angels, Babylon, the satanic triad, gathers the secular political powers of the world to its side. She rides the beast. For a short time, united institutions of religion dominate the world's governments, uh, turning their fury against the saints. But the drying up of the Euphrates, Revelation 16, 12, symbolically portrays the time when the secular political powers that supported the harlot Babylon turn on her and destroy her. God saves his end-time remnant for, from destruction. After the fall of Babylon, the secular powers of the world meet their end at the second coming. So this is to suggest, if I may, that the second angel's message, which expands in Revelation 18 to a louder message, repeated, is going to lead to uh, uh, the, the everybody in the world making a choice. You either come out of her and you belong to God's faithful people, or you remain with her and you get the mark of the beast. You get the seal of God or you get the mark of the beast. In order to understand these visions in Revelation, we must understand a certain principle. Like Daniel in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, John was given a vision which he apparently did not understand, and then he was given an explanation. The visions can relate to events happening anywhere in the universe at any time in history. But when the explanations are given, 
they are almost always linked to the times and places of the prophet himself. Daniel saw a great image, but it was related to Nebuchadnezzar and his time. Thus we can learn that there is a very significant difference between visions which the prophets see and the later explanations. What are the important differences between these two versions of the visions? Why, why do we have visions and then explanations? Why doesn't God just straight away give the explanations? Seems like there's some parallels happening with those early visions that the prophets had. And then we get them interpreted at the end time in a different way. But mm -hmm. that seems pretty parallel in a lot of ways. Yeah. The ideas. Well, in this lesson, we've talked about events from the distant past way up to and including many events, many events still future. It might be difficult to think of life applications in light of all this, but one or two things are very clear. We need to be establishing ourselves so firmly grounded in the biblical truth that we cannot be shaken. And more than that, we need to be spreading the truth of the three angels' messages to all those around us. And while we must be cautious in our presentation of these facts, we must recognize that God's worst enemies in the end will be those who claim to be Christians. Pride and stubbornness can destroy people. Which side of this conflict will you be on? So how are we going to, what's going to be the separating message we just read up there? The giving of the second angel's message. Some people are going to be giving the three angels' messages, including the, third, the second angel's message. And what group is that? God's faithful people, right? Yeah. And who are they trying to call out? The fallen. The, the people from, who need to come out of Babylon. Anyone who will listen, really. And the people on the other side will be who? Those who won't listen, won't listen. right? Yeah. And isn't that pretty much a description of how the battle has gone all the way along? There's always those people who are willing to listen to God, willing to take his side, willing to stand up for him. And on the opposite side, what do we have? The rebellious. Yeah. The people who want to do it their way. What is Satan's key message? Selfishness. I want to do it my way. Don't tell me what to do. I want to do it my way. That's really the basis for all sin. Have we... Have we yourself first. Yeah. Do we, do we see anybody in the world who talks like that in our day? More important than God. Wow. Okay, let's close. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to study these events and try to understand them. We, we need to keep studying them so we can more and more get a, at least somewhat of a picture of what's going to happen. Very important things are going to happen at the end of this world's history, and we need to be on the right side. Help us to remain faithful to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.